Hello, this is a video for SOAN 6441, Advanced Programming Practices. This is week eight. For this week, there's going to be three videos. It's going to be one video for the presentation of build number two. Then there's going to be this video, which is about the presentation of two design patterns that I'm going to ask you to implement in build number two, uh, namely the state and the command pattern. Then the way I'm going to ask you to introduce these uh, design patterns in your design or in your already existing design is to actually do a refactoring operation for each of these two design patterns. So I'm going to have another video to give a brief introduction as to what is refactoring and how I'm going to ask you to do that in the project. So let's go to the slides about design patterns. So you will see that the slides that you will find on the website, a uh, very long list of slides. And we're not covering everything in this particular uh, offering of the course. Uh, we already covered the observer uh, pattern. Uh, here I'm going to cover the state pattern and the uh, command pattern. And then uh, there's going to be two more after that. So you're responsible in, for, for example, the, uh, the material examination uh, for only the patterns that I'm gonna be discussing uh, in class. Even though there are some patterns that are discussed in the slides, if I didn't want to discuss them in class, they are not material for the examinations. So first I'm gonna introduce what is design patterns because there's, might be uh, some people in the class that vaguely know what it is. It's important to know um, what they are for, what to expect when you actually read about design patterns, what is how you should study design patterns, what is important to understand. There's many misconceptions as to what is exactly a design pattern and what are its characteristics and so on and so forth. So a little bit of history, as I sometimes often like to do. Uh, so design patterns is uh, one of those things in computer science uh, that comes from another uh, application area. In this case, it actually comes from uh, architectural um, engineering, building engineering. So the idea, well, in the 19, 80s, I might say that was probably where this uh, started to stick as a concept, uh, design patterns for software. Um, there were at this point, uh, many questions about uh, you know, the size of software uh, that was being designed was uh, increasing extremely rapidly, leading to uh, design problems, uh, a lot of chaos in the, the software. So people were more, uh, more and more uh, being aware of uh, the problem of how to organize your software so that you can actually grow the software more easily in time. So there were more um, emphasis being made on proper design and what is proper design, how do you organize software in a proper way. So that led some people in the software engineering, the emerging software engineering community to look elsewhere to see how people do design in other engineering areas course, uh, uh, building engineering is one of those things where you build things according to what is called design, right? So there is actually some people found uh, a series of books written by a, um, a building engineer called Christopher Alexander, uh, which had a very particular way of, uh, peculiar way of describing um, uh, building design. So he actually came up, I actually, these are the two books that I'm referring to here. I actually read them. And what struck me uh, when I read these books is that he's actually describing in a, some kind of formal way, how can you express design? Or how can you express the relationship between what you want as functionality versus uh, what you will have as structure? of, in this case, a building. And when you read this description, 
if you are a software person, especially if you have some notions of software engineering, then you realize, oh my God, this is, it, it's, it would be like he's talking about software, the relationship between software requirements versus the organization of the software. So that's probably why some software engineers in the 80s uh, uh, read these, these books and uh, eventually realized, oh, we could do that. So we could, that's how we could organize or have some kind of framework for the expression of what is design and how to organize design. So that's how the notion of uh, design patterns, because Christopher Alexander named these things these design uh, elements that he basically imagined as building blocks of a uh, of, of a building of the design of a building he named them design patterns so people basically take took the same name software engineering people took the same name and it adopted the concept applied to software engineering now, this is one of those things you know, in software, uh, in, in uh, computer science, it, time and again in, in history, there is cases of people actually uh, looking here and there in other areas and trying to find some existing solutions, how people solve problems in, the, in other areas and actually adopting these things and applying them to computer science or software engineering. This happens very often in computer science. And that's one very good example. Now, in practice, what does that mean? That's the historical aspect of how this came to be, about how this idea started emerging. But how does it mean in real life? Or how, what, what does it mean in real life? So essentially, what is a design pattern? A design pattern, as you might say, is some idea that some experienced person might have had in order to organize a solution to a certain problem, a typical problem that you may find, not only in your project, but a problem that you may find in several projects. Somebody actually characterized this problem that you find many places and then found a general solution to this problem that you can apply wherever you actually apply find an occurrence of this problem in one of your projects. Essentially, this is re reusing the experience of somebody who had repeatedly seen the same problem and repeatedly applied the same solution to different occurrences of the same problem. Okay. Now, one of the things, of course, if the uh, your description of this problem, if it's too specific, then it's gonna make it less likely that you're gonna see this very specific problem in many, uh, in many projects. So that's why when you, hear, when you read about design patterns, it's always very abstract, okay? And then there's also the danger very often when uh, uh, people explain what's the meaning of a design pattern, then they would give a program example just like I will give you a program example when I teach uh, every of the patterns. Now, as a student, it's very tempting to think that the pattern is the actual implementation. No, the pattern is the actual characterized problem that you want to solve. And the actual program is an example of how this generic solution can actually solve this generic problem. So if you study design patterns by only looking at the example program, you will inevitably be wrong. And then uh, you will be wrong as to what is this design pattern. You will only know what is one solution that uses this design pattern. That's why when you study design pattern, you should understand and the design pattern as expressed in a very abstract way so that it's a, a, an abstract problem that you can now after you know this abstract problem and you see uh, different uh, problems that you have to solve, then you can identify, if you know design patterns, then you can identify the occurrence of a certain abstract problem that is the abstract problem solved by a design pattern. So you see this problem in your particular uh, pr uh, project description. And then you say, oh, I'm going to use, this is the same problem as this design pattern. I'm going to use this design pattern to solve this problem in my project. 
So the more design patterns that you know, the more you'll be able to see where are these uh, typical problems. And if you want, then you can use design patterns to solve them. This has obvious advantages because you're reusing pre-made solutions. And there are many people that actually know design patterns. One of the difficulties when you do software or design uh, is that when you want to uh, understand how a design is working, uh, it, it sometimes it, design is invented by people that have their own very particular idea on how to organize things. And there are lots of different ways you can actually solve the same problem. So every time you come to a same implementation, an implementation for the same problem, you might see a lot of variation as to how it's actually implemented by this person. If this person would actually be using design patterns, then that would have somehow uh, direct them in a certain direction that is somehow uh, standard, okay? So that other people, when they actually look at the design, if there's design pattern in this design, they will more somehow more easily be able to understand how it actually works and how it's organized. Now here I'm teaching uh, design patterns uh, and the, the, the name, this is a dedicated name. When you see, when you hear design patterns, normally that means it's uh, a detailed design, okay? There's also other kinds of design patterns, which are, for example, architectural design patterns. Like when I shown MFC, uh, uh, MVC in a previous lecture, MVC is an architectural design pattern, whereas the uh, observer pattern is a detailed design pattern that is part of the architecture. Okay. So there are various levels of these patterns. Okay. But when you hear about design patterns as a, as a dedicated term, that means uh, patterns that are existing at the detailed design level in the code, not at the abstract architectural design level. Okay, so let's go into, uh, normally, uh, well, there's a book that was written, um, where it's called the, the Gang of Four book, uh, that is the, you know, the, the grandfather or grandmother of all the books uh, written on design patterns. Um, and it, it actually used this structure that I'm gonna show here. Okay. So that's the same structure that I'm trying to use for the description of all the patterns. So that has a way to actually, uh, it provides a way to have homogeneity on how uh, design patterns are described. So that makes it easier to study them and so on. So that's why I'm using this particular way of describing design patterns. And very often when you look on the internet, you'll find a description of design patterns. You will see that it follows more or less the same structure. Structure of description is the following. First, you give a name to a pattern. Uh, you might say, oh, it's only a name. It's, it's not important. Uh, however, it, it is actually important because, you know, when you study design patterns and when you use them, the terms that you use, for example, you say, I'm going to use an observer pattern. And we've already saw the observer pattern as soon as you say observer pattern to a fellow uh, software engineer or programmer, this person will have a pre-made preconception pre about what's the actual meaning of, of what you of what you are referring to. Okay. Observer pattern is about you know communication between the observer and the observable to convey information when the state of an object is changing. The other one is notified. So there's a notification mechanism that's in place, so on and so forth. So this is a very precise kind of thing that you are talking about. So that's why when you refer, if you use the term observer and you say, my code is organized using an observer, then you should really make sure that you are really using the observer pattern and that you're not just pretending that you're using an observer pattern and that it's actually not an observer according to the description of the observer pattern. So it's, you see, it's, it's kind of the, all these names that are associated with these patterns, they have a very precise definition. 
if you start diverging from the definitions and you use these terms in places where you should not, if you claim to be using a pattern, but you're not, and you say, this is what I'm using, it just becomes more confusing than if you're not using these terms. So the name is a very important aspect. When you want to communicate with other people, uh, you use this name and then people know what you're talking about or assume that you know what you're talking about. Then there's the problem. So the pattern is actually solving a problem. So as I said, I hinted at before, some people, when you talk about design patterns and they saw some examples, then they would actually associate the example of implementation of the pattern as being the pattern itself. Now, the pattern is both a description of a problem, as I mentioned before. The idea is that you have a set of design patterns. They each solve a different kind of problem. And that's when you look, when you're faced with your new project, and then you see some at some place that you, there is a certain uh, sub problem that you have to solve, then you can do a mapping between this sub problem and this the problem that is solved by a certain design pattern. You pick this pattern and you solve this problem with the pattern. That's why it's very important that each pattern describe the problem that it's going to solve so that you can do this mapping between the problem that you want to solve and the problem that is solved by a pattern. If you learn the, the pattern by only learning the solution of the pattern, it's not going to help you make this mapping. It's important that you study also the problem that the pattern is solving. Then you have the, <coughs> sorry, the solution of the problem. Of course, the, pro the, the, the pattern is providing a solution. So as the design patterns are, first of all, these are object-oriented patterns. Uh, so it's organized in terms of classes and methods that are interacting together. It's very often described using UML diagrams, uh, association diagrams and uh, sequence diagrams. So when you study design patterns, it's also important that you understand this kind of diagram. It's also very often using uh, concepts such as uh, uh, polymorphism and inheritance and so on. So if you want to study design patterns, it assumes that you already uh, know very well these concepts. Another thing about uh, design patterns, it's important also to, to know that there's consequences. <clears throat> One of the uh, prevalent, uh, not prevalent, but um, um, universal consequences of uh, applying design patterns is that if you have a certain problem and then you solve it with your own solution, uh, then you will come to a certain design that had a certain number of classes and a certain number of methods in this uh, solution to this problem. Generally speaking, in most of the cases, if you take this problem and you actually solve it with a design pattern, inevitably the application of this pattern is gonna make you introduce more classes that are part of the structure of the design pattern inside of your design. So your design compared to your own solution, the design uh, with the pattern solution is going to have more classes, probably gonna have more code, and it's probably thus gonna consume more memory and uh, there's gonna be more uh, indirections between function calls. So there's gonna be more function calls. It's gonna, every time you make a certain uh, operation, then it's gonna be a little bit slower because it's gonna involve more code. And then your executable is gonna be somehow bigger because you have more classes. So universally, generally speaking, when you adopt design patterns, you are making your code a little bit bigger does not mean that it's going to be more complex, it's, but it's going to be undeniably, uh, it is going to be more lines of code. Uh, there's also, of course, that if you are uh, doing something that must be uh, extremely optimized in terms of performance and or, uh, uh, either the speed of execution or the memory consumption, uh, it's probably not a good idea to actually use design patterns. Okay. 
like if you're doing uh, hardware, things like uh, graphics cards, which uh, manipulate uh, gigabytes of, of, uh, of data uh, at a time uh, in a very, uh, in real time, uh, you absolutely don't want to use design patterns in such an implementation. Okay. So if you, it is going to slow down a little bit your implementation and it's going to be consuming a little bit more memory. So that's just one of the possible consequences. Each of the different patterns have but very often there are different uh, consequences. It's also important because here you're basically saying, what I'm telling you is that you have a problem, you identify this problem can be solved by this pattern. So I'm gonna use this pattern. Now, before you use this pattern, you should be aware of what's the consequence of adopting this pattern. Okay. Is this consequence uh, um, going to make you uh, miss some of the requirements. For example, if your requirement, your main requirement is low memory consumption and you apply design patterns, you're, you're, you're not going in the direction of your, in the right direction versus your uh, uh, low memory consumption um, requirement. So yes, the patterns have consequences. If you wanna use them, you have to know what are the consequences of using them? So essentially here, I'm gonna let you read this uh, for yourself, but this is essentially what I'm, I said before. So uh, the name this is basically, it adds to your vocabulary. When you discuss with people, they, you use, for example, the term observer pattern, then people know what you mean by that, but it, basically it's a communication uh, tool that you use the name. Uh, the problem, very important to understand not only the solution of the problem and even less an example of application of a certain pattern. Very important if you study your design patterns that you don't only study the example. That inevitably, there's going to be an example that's given to you. But don't study the example. You should also study what is the problem if you want to use design pattern in real life. Uh, solution, uh, it's always going to be an abstract solution. Okay? And then there's a terminology that is uh, uh, defined in uh, each of these abstract solutions. It's important to learn what is the terminology, as we will see later. For example, in the, the observer pattern, we saw that there's the observer, the observable, uh, sometimes called uh, the subject. So it's important that you know these terms that you are able to know what's their meaning and how you identify, for example, in your own design, if you apply the observer pattern, what is the subject inside of your own implementation for the observer pattern. Uh, consequences, okay. Uh, there's also different categories of design patterns. Uh, we're going to cover some of them. Uh, um, in uh, today, I'm going to cover uh, two behavioral patterns, which are the uh, state pattern and the command pattern. <clears throat> there's also creational patterns. Uh, behavioral patterns are basically patterns that enable you to uh, implement uh, behavior, basically the behavior of the methods of the classes. So essentially you're kind of injecting behavior in an existing class, more or less. That's what most of the uh, behavioral patterns are doing. Creational patterns are patterns that enable you to create objects. This may seem trivial, but very often when you're creating very large objects that are composed of other objects that are composed of other objects, only the creation of an object can actually become uh, quite uh, involved. So creational patterns involve the creation of objects. And in structural patterns, the name says it, it's about how you, you organize or group together your, uh, your classes in your design. So let's go to um, let's go to my fifty-seven state pattern. 
Okay, so let's go jump right in into uh, the state pattern. So let's see what is the state pattern. So it's here, you see here, I'm gonna start by describing the thing, the, the pattern in a very abstract way, basically describing what is it that I want to achieve <clears throat> using the state pattern. So that when I see this thing I want to achieve in my own uh, project description, then I can say, oh, this looks like the state pattern. Then I'm going to say, yes, let's use the state pattern. And you will see that the two examples I will give about the state pattern and the command pattern are related directly to two things that are happening in the project. So what's the motivation? What's, what is this pattern <coughs> enabling you to what is it in a problem that enables you to say, oh, this looks like, this, I like what the state problem is doing. Motivation. Sometimes we want to be able to alter the behavior of an object when its internal state changes. So it has to do with state change. And the fact that as the state is changing, you may want to have the behavior of this object to start changing. So that one of their methods when you call it, depending on what is the state of the object, this method will have a different behavior that depends on what state you this object is currently in. As well, you want also to make it easy to add new varying behavior that comes with new states. So you might say in these methods that vary according to state, you might say, I'm gonna put an if statement, if certain condition, then this, the, this method does this. If another condition, then this method does this, uh, does something else. So that's state varying behavior somehow. But then if you have this and you have many methods and then uh, you do this with an if then else, then uh, if you add a new state or you change the structure of your states, uh, then you will have to change all the code or add an, another if statement in every of your methods, okay? Which is not very handy, of course. So the state pattern would help you in any case you see this uh, pattern of problem, state pattern would probably be a good solution. What is the intent? What does it do? What is, how does it work, the state pattern? What's the intent of the state pattern? First of all, you encapsulate the varying behavior in different classes associated with different states. So the idea is that you will have a superclass, which is gonna be the state, uh, and then you're gonna have subclasses of states. And then for each of the subclasses of states, you will implement methods Essentially, your state is going to be some kind of abstract class, or yeah, well, yeah, some some abstract class, and then you will uh, force your subclasses to actually provide an implementation for a list of classes that are declared in the um, as abstract in the abstract class. And then, of course, in your each of your sub subclasses of state, then each of the methods that are implemented will do something different or slightly different depending on which state they are, okay? Then what you will do is will, you will take one of these state objects and you will actually put it inside of your object that you want to be, uh, var uh, whose behavior you want to change according to state. So you will inject the state uh, based behavior in the target object by having the object contain an, insta an instance of the state uh, based uh, encapsulated behavior. So inside of these state classes, you will encapsulate, you will code, you make so put some code that actually varies across the different states. Then you will take this code or this class or this object, and then you will put it inside of the object that you want to, uh, you want this object to vary depending on what state it is. So then this object will actually use the methods, the, 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 the methods of the state object that is in it to actually achieve a state varying behavior. So that if you change this state object and you replace it by another state object that, that uh, uh, has different behavior, 
then suddenly your object that uses this state object will itself start uh, behaving in a different way because it is using the different behavior of the state uh, that is embedded in the state object. And eventually, as I just said, upon request of the state uh, of the object's behavior, um, uh, it, it will actually use the behavior of the state object in order to alter its own behavior, depending on what is the particular state object that is instantiated right now in itself. Now, here is a UML diagram describing uh, the abstract uh, solution to this problem. So that's the structure of the solution. So here, this is where I was saying to you that uh, there is some um, terminology. Every state has its own very abstract terminology. <clears throat> so in this case, you have the client, the context, the state, and then what is called the, the concrete states. So state one, state two, state three. Uh, oh, should be three here. Uh, so, so these are concrete states. So the context object is this object that you want to vary. You want its, be <coughs> sorry, its behavior to vary depending on what state this object is in right now. So that's the, in terms of the terminology of the state pattern, this is the context object. Um, in our case, in the example, as I will show you later, uh, we have the game engine. So the game engine is, you know, in the game that we play, that we implement, there is different phases of the game. So depending on which phase you are, then you want to achieve different behavior. Okay. Like for example, I said uh, in the build number one, I said, uh, here are the different states. And then uh, each, for each different states, there are commands that you can actually give to the command interpreter to do an action as you use this uh, software or this game. So depending on what state or what phase you are, then the different commands will have different action. Okay, or some of the commands will be invalid in a certain state and so on. So in, the, in our case, in our example, the context will be the game engine object. And then the state, there will be a state object inside of the context object. And that would be uh, the state that we will design later. Basically here, the states will be phases of the game. So our state class is going to be named phase. And then we're going to have substates for each phase that we have defined in the project description. And that is the phases of the game. Then the uh, context object, well, it contains an object of type state. Uh, this is either an interface or an abstract class, depending here, you, you, you can use either a, a, an interface or an abstract class. In the example, I've used an abstract class. Anytime you, anytime you see uh, in, in a design pattern, that you see that there's an interface, sometimes it can also be an abstract class. Uh, okay, and then the, uh, the context has, of course, a method to actually change the state because the state is something that will change. So you should have a method that enable you to change the state of the object. And when you change the state of the object, then its behavior is going to change because this, this object that is here, that is used by the methods of uh, your object here. So when you implement methods here, um, so that's what the request here is essentially a method of your, uh, of your uh, context object. <clears throat> so then you execute a method, what it will do eventually if this method is uh, uh, state uh, dependent, the, the behavior of this uh, method is, depends on what on the state will vary across different states, then inevitably the implementation of this method will execute some methods into the state object. And then depending on which one it is, then the method that is will be called here 
will actually be a different method that varies across the different states. Thus, this method request will have eventually a different behavior because it took decisions that depend on each of the different behavior that is here. That's essentially the, the idea. You see that once you understand it, it's not very complicated, but uh, just, you know, to do it for the first time, so it's, it's not necessarily uh, trivial. Okay, so here is the description, essentially what I've just uh, explained before. Again, that's the same diagram here. What is the context? So the context is the object whose behavior needs to be state state specific. So how do you identify when to apply the state uh, uh, pattern in a certain problem is when you have an object and then this object, depending on a certain context or state, you want it to behave in a different way uh, according to what are, what's the variation of the context inside uh, of, the, of the state inside of this object. It will maintain a reference to a concrete state. So one of these here that is going to be a subclass or an implementation of the subclass of this abstract class or an, uh, implements this interface here. So one of, uh, an object of one of these classes here is gonna be put inside of our object here, uh, which is used to define the current uh, state of the context object. So this state object here actually defines in what state this context object is at the moment. Of course, then you can use the set state method to actually change the state depending on what's currently happening. Uh, some of its method will use the state specific behavior of the state object to provide state specific behavior. So that's why I was saying request here is a method of the context class uh, that we may want to this behavior to change depending on what state we are in. So, and so inevitably this request method will eventually call some methods in the state object. So depending on what state object is inside here, it will call either this or this or this, which is gonna make it make it different decisions and so on and have different results that is dependent on the state. Uh, when the state object is changed, the behavior of the context object will change. That's what we want to achieve. Okay. Note that here, there's no if and so on. You don't switch context by using if and so on. It is basically replace the state object. That's the only thing you have to do. If you want to add new varying behavior, you just add a new state. Okay. If you want to change the behavior for one state, all the behavior is defined in one of your state objects. Okay, so it uh, provides also with modularization of the behavior associated with a particular state and also modular adding of new state, uh, state uh, dependent behavior. The state, so that's the state here, it's the class that defines the operations that each uh, state must handle. Uh, it's generally implemented as an abstract class or an interface. Here it's written as interface. It can also be an abstract class. In the example I will give, it's gonna be an abstract class. Uh, the concrete state is one of those state objects here. So essentially this is a subclass of a state that must implement all the methods that are specified in the interface, if it's an interface. If it's an abstract class that actually allows you to define behavior that is default behavior for the, uh, for the states. Okay. In the example, I even have uh, used subclasses for groups of states, as we will see. Uh, the behavior of the state pattern is as it goes. Uh, first, uh, as the context object is created, uh, it's set up with this initial state object, so, which is normally provided in the constructor. As you create this object, you provide with the initial state of this object. <clears throat> or it might be a default constructor that provides a default state for this object. 
or you can use set state after the object has been created. But for this object to operate, there needs to be a state that is in the object. Second, when the state dependent behavior of the context object is called, it uses the state's uh, objects methods to provide state dependent behavior. So you will have methods that are inside of your context object that will call the methods of the encapsulated state object that is inside of this context object. That will enable you to implement methods who have state dependent behavior. Uh, third, state changes can happen because of course you are talking about a state. So eventually <laughs> which, what you want to achieve is that you're able to change the state so that the behavior will change depending on what is the state, the new state. Uh, so you need to figure out uh, what is it that uh, will change the state, okay? So it's basically you're defining some kind of uh, uh, of, of DFA here, a fine state uh, automaton. You're making one of your objects become some kind of fine state automaton, as I will describe uh, later. So uh, the state need to change. So how, what is it that can actually make the state change? So note that we have this method here, uh, set state, which you can call from somewhere to actually change the state. So question is, where is this somewhere? What is it that can actually trigger a, a change of state? So if this set state method is public, then you can have another object actually forcing your object to change its state. Maybe that's something you don't want, in which case you may want to put set state as private so that only the object itself can decide to change its state. So that's a, depending on the situation, that might be uh, two different options. Uh, second, uh, can be from an internal call to set state. Maybe the object itself, the context object itself, depending on something that's happening, will decide I need to change state. And then we'll call set state on its own. Uh, we'll, call, we'll call its own set state to itself change its state, thus changing its own behavior. Uh, or, which is very frequent, uh, from a call to set state from within a state object. Uh, upon a state transition condition. So it's possible that in the code of some of these methods here, that the state itself, uh, the state object itself will at some point realize that it needs actually to change state because a certain condition has happened. So it should in this, if that happens, particularity is that you should, uh, the, the context object should actually have a reference to the context object so that it can actually call a set state of the context object from the state object. Okay. In general, uh, the state object always has this reference to the context. Uh, the state object has a reference to the context object but it's not necessarily used unless uh, you want the state objects to be able to change the state of their parent, not their parent, but their uh, containing uh, context object. So that's uh, the three different ways a state change can happen. So here's the example. So very important, again, I repeat here, I'm gonna give an example very important that you don't, don't jump to the conclusion, okay, I'm gonna study design patterns, I'm gonna only study the example. That would be a wrong way to uh, learn design patterns. What's important is not what problem we're solving, it's what is what particular problem this example is solving is rather what is the general problem of what uh, is the problem that is solved by the pattern. Uh, <clears throat> Okay, so let's go with this. So, so we have the context, we have the states, and we have the um, uh, concrete states. So what is in the client? So what is it that we, uh, what's gonna be the mapping between these abstract things and the concrete things that are gonna have in the example? So the problem is in the game engine, as I hinted at before, 
the game engine in the project, uh, we have in the game, we have different states. For example, uh, when you start the whole thing, if you remember the requirements, uh, there were a place where you were actually editing a map. Okay. So this is one of the states of the usage of this software. When you're editing the map, <clears throat> there are commands that you can use while you're editing the map. There are other commands that are defined for during play. If you try to use the play commands during the editing, it should not be valid commands. Okay. Um, and then there are also uh, commands that you can use that can trigger uh, transitions between, uh, between states. Uh, so I, I will let you uh, go back to uh, figure out what are what were the commands and what were the phases of the game and so on. So for example, in our game, there was the, uh, well, the editing phase, and then there was a play phase, and then you had some kind of uh, game setup phase, after which you would, you would start playing the game. Okay, so that would be the main play loop, if you want. Important to realize here, the example is not about the war zone game, it's about the risk game. So these are not exactly the same phases, okay? So don't, first of all, also don't think I'm asking you to implement exactly this in your project. That's not the point, okay? Very important. This is just an example. It happens to look like what you have in the game. This does not say, please take this code and put it in your game, in, in, your, uh, in your implementation. So we have the game engine. In our case, the game engine is the context object. So game engine is the context object of the state pattern. So, and then it has an, uh, an, a state object. In our case, the state object or the state class is the class named phase because it's a game phase that is the state in our case. Uh, so in the game engine, there's an object of type face, just like in the design here in the context class, there's a member called uh, of type state, which is this uh, of this class here, which in our case is a phase. So we have a phase in the game engine. Then we have a method set phase that allows you to change the phase, right? Which is gonna be called, uh, mainly by the methods that are going to be implemented by the concrete phase objects or classes. It's important that you understand that there's these uh, ellipses or three dots here. The code that I provide here is not complete code. If you only read this, you see, well, well it doesn't make sense. I'm just basically uh, showing uh, <laughs> the most important things in this, in this code, right? this example. Now, as we start, we can actually, uh, as, we, as we execute this, because when we start the game here, it's essentially creating game, game engine uh, object and then calling start. This is how it's all start. So this is what's happening here. So in this method start here, so eventually I'm gonna be calling set phase. So depending on what's happening, you can go to the preload phase or the play setup phase depending on what the user is entering on the screen or on, in the game console. So you see that the game engine itself is actually uh, changing uh, its own uh, state in this method start. Then at other places in this code, it's also calling game phase is my uh, state object. So it's calling the methods in the state object as it's processing here. So as soon as it's gonna be using these methods here, it's gonna be using a method of the current object that is here. So we'll see that there's gonna be many different states. So if I, I, I assert, I'm, I'm in a certain state and I call load map, then it's gonna execute load map of this particular uh, phase object. If I change the state and I re-execute again load map, then it's potentially gonna be something different that's gonna happen. So this is how this method here is using the state varying behavior to have itself uh, behave in a different manner. Okay. Load map and reinforce and next, these are all methods that are 
uh, uh, listed in the abstract class here. So you see, this is my abstract class phase. So that's my state object, my state class. Uh, it contains a game engine, uh, a reference to a game engine. Why? Because some of these, many of these methods will want to change the state of the game engine. So when you're gonna execute one of these things here, they're gonna say, I wanna change state. For example, there is a method next. When you execute next, what it does is that it goes to the next state. Of course, the state next state is about calling uh, set, set phase of this object here. So this method would need to have a reference to this game engine in order to call uh, set phase. So if you want your methods here to be able to change the state, and you need to have this reference inside of the state objects. Uh, another reason why, or main reason why I'm cr I created my uh, state objects uh, as abstract classes rather than interfaces is that here I have some methods that are actually um, uh, common to all the states. So here I have a actual implementation for a method if I wouldn't have an interface, I would not be able to do that. But because it's an abstract class, I can state all the methods that my all my state, my subclasses of state will have to implement, but I can also provide some methods which are actually common to all my subclasses. Okay. That's one advantage of using an abstract class. If you don't have this in your design, you might as well use an interface. Then eventually, again, yeah, let's repeat of the design here. Uh, eventually, what I'm going to have is I'm going to have a uh, phase and then edit phase and then main play and then play and then preload, postload, uh, play setup, reinforcement, attack, fortification, and end. These are all going to be phases. Now, as you see, I have superclasses and subclasses here of the state. So this is essentially my state. This is the class here. And then each of these here are all abstract classes. So these are all somehow the super class state here. And my concrete states are the classes in this hierarchy, which are not abstract, which are these here. Okay, so these are all the states I can actually be in and I can actually call the methods for. These are not real states, they're only abstract classes. And then you see here, there's a diagram, it's actually a state transition diagram that describes from, from each state, where can I go? For example, from preload, I can go to postload and then go to play setup and then to reinforcement, uh, attack, fortification, reinforcement, attack, fortification, and so on. And then if I'm in uh, main play, then I can go to end. Okay. So the, all these transitions are actually implemented in the methods that are implemented in each of these states here. Okay. It's important that you, when you define this, uh, uh, this uh, you, 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 you use a state diagram that you do some good design decision that you that, uh, describe your design and that you make sure that you understand the big picture and all the details of what are the states and what are the transitions between your states. Then if you need to have groups of states that have common behavior, then you may want to create uh, subclasses. You don't need to create the subclasses here or the intermediate classes, intermediate abstract classes, but if you want to have for example, if these two states here have two behavior that are exactly the same, then instead of replicating them, then you can actually create another intermediate abstract class that provides the implementation for these two behaviors that are the same. That would prevent you from duplicating it here. So that if you use the behavior of preload, then, and you use a certain method that is, has been identified as being common, then the runtime system is not gonna find it here. So it's gonna go find it in the uh, upper level class. Okay. If it doesn't find it here, then it's gonna look here. That's why using abstract classes 
has this potential of uh, enabling you to create default behavior for groups of states. You know, you don't have to have that, but if you, if that's a particularity of your of your design, then that's that's how you should do it. Then here's okay. So first, uh, the methods, all the methods that uh, need to be implemented for this pattern, are uh, listed here. Okay, so these are all the methods that any state can actually be asked to uh, execute. The thing here is that, uh, as we saw in, in class when I described the first bill and as you implemented it, there are some of these, these behaviors that are gonna be uh, invalid in a certain state. For example, if you're now editing the map and then you type the command uh, uh, attack or reinforce, there's no reinforce or attack. You're just editing the, the editing a map. Okay, so then reinforce and attack will have no defined behavior uh, uh, in if you are in the editing uh, editing a map edition phase. So, for example, if you go to uh, preload and then you actually implement attack, so preload attack is not defined but uh, preload is a sub a class of uh, edit. And then you see here attack is print invalid common message, which is eventually printing the common behavior of all the states is printing, is printing uh, invalid command in this state. Okay. Okay. So here's my play state. So if I'm in play state, then if I do the show map, then it's displaying the map. Uh, if I uh, try to edit a country as I'm playing, then of course this is an invalid command. So it, call, it calls the behavior that says this was invalid, I'm not executing here, anything here. It's just an invalid request. Uh, if you're trying to save as you play, of course, invalid again. And then if you, for example, say end game as you play, then it basically goes to, it sets the phase of the game engine to, uh, to end, okay. the end phase. And the end phase, the particularity is that it does not accept any command. So that's the end point. Uh, then I may have in play, I may have main play, just like I described here. In play, I can have main play. And in main play, what I have is the three main phases of the game of risk, which is reinforcement, attack, fortification. And then eventually, as I'm doing reinforcement, it will have a transition to attack. And then when I do attack, it's going to have a transition to fortification. And fortification is going to have a transition back to reinforcement. So if you go and see main play, uh, attack. So if you go attack, you type an attack command during the attack phase, then it's going to be uh, implementing the attack, saying attack done, and then it's going to go to fortify. So from attack, you go to fortification. Uh, okay, so let's settle that. And then the same thing for my edition phase, as I mentioned before. So in my edition phase here, all I can do is uh, load a map and then edit the map and then save the map. Uh, particularity of it is, um, sorry. If I'm in uh, edit mode, uh, then the only thing I can do is uh, show map. So in any of the subclasses of edit, which is preload and postload, I can actually show the map. That's why that this is a common method or behavior that is common to both of these states here. That's why it doesn't appear. You don't have show map here. Why? Because it appears here. If you call show map of this type here, because it's a subclass of edit, then show map is gonna branch to this here using the dynamic binding. 
Uh, okay, and preload, uh, what you can do, but it's called preload because if you, you know, there's things you can do uh, after you loaded the map. Uh, so if you actually load the map, then it basically loads the map and then goes to post load, in which case you change the state to post load. And then you would be able to do these commands here. So you see that if you don't load, then you cannot save. However, if you load, you come to this state, in which case now you can save. Okay. You see, this is the kind of uh, state uh, varying behavior. You cannot save if you don't load a map. So that's it about uh, this, uh, this uh, particular pattern. So let's go with the other one. So, so I'm going to be asking you in build number two to actually change your implementation of, uh, of the game engine so that it actually uses the state uh, pattern. Okay. Exactly what you do, it doesn't matter as long, sorry, as long as you use the state pattern. Uh, next thing is the uh, command pattern. Again, here I'm going to describe in an abstract way what is the command uh, pattern uh, in general. And then I'm going to go to a specific example. And again, you will see that this relates to the project. And I'm going to ask you to somehow refactor your project code so that it now uses the command pattern. So what is the command pattern? First of all, motivation. Sometimes a request for a result is created at a different time or site compared to where and when it will be executed. Or we don't want to know what is the actual method being executed to process the request or what object will eventually execute it. So essentially here, you are making a request for certain processing. Eventually, yes, it's gonna be executed by a certain object. But in this case, what you're doing is that you're creating this request. It is going to be somehow conveyed to another object that is gonna execute this request. But there, you know, you just basically, you know, if you want, normally if you want an object to execute a request, you directly call a method in this object right now. And then it computes this, this, uh, this, this request and then you get the result. Here, what you wanna do is say, I'm gonna create this request. I'm gonna somehow use a certain mechanism to convey this request eventually it's going to be picked up by this other object, which is then going to execute it. Okay, so you're not going to call directly a method directly now on this object. Rather, you are going to <clears throat> somehow encapsulate this request in an object. And then later on, another object is going to pick it up, this request, and then execute it. Okay. Uh, in these cases, we may want to create a request for a result, store it, and then process it elsewhere or sometime after. Okay. <clears throat> uh, here, I'm gonna point out directly to the problem that I have in mind, which is the commands in the Warzone project. So the player is creating commands. And as it's creating the commands, these commands are not executed. If the user is saying, <clears throat> I want to uh, deploy armies, I wanna create an order to deploy armies, then basically the player just says, I want to deploy 10 armies on my country, Ontario. That's it. The Ontario, right away, Ontario is not receiving five armies just basically stated, I am issuing a command that eventually when executed is going to add five air armies to my territory, Ontario. Then later on, as I described in the build and I hope you have implemented, later on the game engine is gonna get the commands from the player and call execute on the command. Then as the command is executed, only then 
the Ontario is going to receive five new armies. Okay, so you see, this is exactly the same thing I was just describing. <clears throat> the point where I issued the command is not where the actual action is happening. The point where this command is executed is when another object gets the command, somehow unpacks the commands and execute it. That's where the action is happening. What's the intent of this pattern? Uh, it separates an operation from the object that creates it and the object that executes it. So the player is actually not uh, uh, calling the territory to actually increase its number of armies. Okay. The player is only saying, I wish I would uh, add five armies to the territory uh, Ontario. It does not call the method that will increase uh, five uh, number of armies uh, to the Ontario uh, territory itself at this point. Later on, the game engine will receive the command and then execute it. Then we'll call the method to increase the number of armies on the territory. So the utterance of the <laughs> request is the only thing that the, uh, the first object is actually doing. The player is just uttering, I want to add four ar five armies on Ontario. It's not happening right now. Only when the game engine receives it, then it's happening. So, and also you're, you're gonna encapsulate a request and all its required parameters so that they can be stored and conveyed to the executor uh, of a self-contained unit. <clears throat> so here's the uh, diagram, described, the UML diagram describing this pattern. So as always, you have the client. So the client is uh, the main program that is using this pattern. The invoker, is the one that creates the command. In our case, that's going to be the player that's creating a command. In our case, the command is going to be an order. So in the game uh, terminology, we are create the player is creating, is issuing orders. So the invoker is going to be the player, the command is going to be an order. Then of course, there's going to be different kinds of commands. For example, uh, 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 a deploy order or a advance order or a pacify order. Okay. Then uh, this uh, command is going to be uh, encapsulated inside of this object here. Then uh, the uh, game engine is actually going to receive this, uh, this command and then it's actually going to operate the command by actually, what's gonna happen, for example, if you have a deploy order, the invoker, the player is gonna say, the target of my deploy order is territory Ontario, and I want to add five armies. So the parameters to this command is the Ontario territory and the number five. So it's going to encapsulate these two things inside of the command so that when the client, which is the game engine, actually gets the command, it will eventually call the territory Ontario uh, method to increase its number of armies to by five. So in this case, the receiver is the territory. Sometimes the receiver, let's say you have a pacify order, so let's say the player is saying, I want to pacify the player red. So the player is going to be encapsulated in the command. And uh, well, in this case, the only um, parameter is the player, the target player. So when the game engine is going to receive this command, then it's going to call the method in the player that's going to make this player pacify so that it cannot do attacks anymore. So client is the thing that is <clears throat> driving this whole process and eventually receiving the, uh, the, uh, the commands. And then the invoker is the one that creates the commands. 
And then the receiver is the object whose uh, behavior is going to be triggered when the command is executed. So invoker is the object that creates the command object to carry out the operation. It's this one here, the receiver, this one, is the object that will be affected or used when the command gets executed. So in this case would be the territory or the player being pacified. Uh, the command is a class that defines the operations uh, that each state uh, must uh, uh, oh, that's a mistake. Uh, this is the class that defines uh, what is what are the methods, uh, uh, what is the method to be executed by the client, because the client will receive um, the client will receive the command, uh, and then will uh, want to execute it. So there must be an execute method. So that's why the command has an execute method. So you receive the command called execute calls methods that are going to affect the receiver that's inside of the command. Concrete command is an object that contains the necessary uh, the, the, the context necessary for the execution of the operation and implements code that carries the operation that is eventually going to change the state or call action in the receiver. Behavior, uh, first invoker and the client are created. So the game engine is created and the player is created. Player, uh, the client instantiate the commands. Uh, the, the invoker instantiates a command object uh, and then creating a concrete command depending on which one of the commands it wants to create. All the parameters inside of the uh, that are concerned with this particular command are going to be encapsulated inside of the command. So let's say you want to do deploy, or let's say you want to do an attack order. Okay, so you attack, or you you want to do an advance order. So you got an advance order. There's three uh, parameters. There is, uh, well, there's actually four. There is uh, the source uh, territory, the target territory, the number of armies you want to move from the source to the target, and the identity of who is wants to do this this uh, this action. So, a reference to each of these parameters is going to be encapsulated inside of the command, so that later on you can actually execute it. Then the command object is conveyed somehow. The pattern does not say how. The command is conveyed uh, conveyed uh, to uh, to the client. Okay. So invoker is creating the command, is putting it somewhere where the client can actually fetch the command and execute it. In our case, in the game, uh, what we do is the player is putting the commands inside uh, the, the orders inside of its own order list. And as the game engine is executing, it will ask the player to give them their next order and then execute it. That's where, that's how the commands, uh, the orders are conveyed to the game engine. And the client executes the uh, uh, execute method to uh, uh, for, for the command to take effect. Uh, okay, so here's the actual uh, implementation here in the example. Again, this is, uh, I'm not going to explain all the details here. I will leave you to uh, open the code and, and uh, figure out, execute it and figure out all the details. There are, again, some details here that are not mentioned. I'm just showing the main uh, the main points here. Uh, this is the client here. The client is uh, this object here. This is the game engine. <clears throat> the game engine is actually uh, the one that uh, will call the player to actually create an order. So the player is the invoker that is going to create uh, the orders. It is told the game engine tells the player to create the orders. The player is the invoker, but uh, 
it is actually the player that is the invoker because P is the player, create order is the method that creates the, uh, the, the orders. So the create order here is eventually creating an order and then putting it in the orders list. So putting it in the orders list is a way to convey the uh, orders to the game engine. Why or how? Because eventually after the game engine asks the players to put the orders in their orders list, it will execute, execute all orders, which will then ask the players, give me your next order from your order list, and then we'll call execute on the order. Okay. So the game engine asks the players to put an order in their list, and then eventually ask the order, the, the, the players, give me your next order, and then they will execute the order themselves. Okay. Well, that's exactly what I described before. Um, so here's a particular example of an order. Here, this is a deploy order. So you see here that for every of the uh, commands, you actually have a, um, a data member for this particular command for each of the parameters that are necessary or the context that is necessary to actually actually execute this command. So example, a deploy order uh, needs to know what territory is the actual uh, target of the deploy order and how many, or, uh, uh, how many uh, armies want the player wants to be deployed and as well as the player because a player, when you execute, when you verify the deploy order, the, um, the territory must be a territory that is owned by the player that is issuing the order. Okay. It would be illegal for a player to deploy armies on a territory that is owned by an enemy player. Three parameters to deploy order. There are three data members in this uh, order or this command uh, class. Then, of course, when you create a deploy order, <coughs> as here, deploy. So you pass the three parameters when you create the deploy order. Then it the, the, these objects come into the object here and then are uh, put inside of the deploy object, the deploy order object. Then when you actually went, so that's when the player created it, that would actually put all of these things inside of the object. Then when the uh, game engine will call execute, game engine calls execute here, then the uh, game engine will have all of these things here that enables it to actually execute the order. For example, add five armies to the territory. First of all, you wanna validate the order uh, as we specified in the project. Uh, so you have a valid method here. So it checks the conditions by which the order might be valid. In this case, it's only that the territory in, in question is owned by the player. So these, uh, this can be uh, calculated because the territory as well as the player are known inside of the order itself. Thus, I can actually call these methods here on the objects here that are references to the actual objects that were passed uh, to the, 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 the parameter upon creation of the order. Okay. So you see that this actually relying on reference semantics, which Java is, uh, is implementing. If you'd be doing this in C++, that would be an entirely different thing. You have to make very careful that you would be actually passing references. But here, thankfully we're using Java, so we don't have to, to, to worry about that. <clears throat> So call execute validates the order. If the order is valid, then essentially what it does, it, it adds <coughs> uh, this number of armies to the number of armies of this territory. And then this is here a uh, print order function that enables me to output to the console what happens when I execute this order. 
And this is my uh, order uh, interface, which has execute and then valid method, and then the uh, should be called validate right? anyway, and then my print order uh, function. So my order is the command. So, and then this is here a concrete command deploy. Okay. <laughs> if you look in the code, there would be uh, an order uh, for each of the, um, uh, the pacify, or do I have it here? Yes. Uh, this is the advanced order. So you see the advanced order actually has the source territory, the target territory, uh, who is initiating this order and how many armies you want uh, to want to advance from the source to the target. So all of this here must be stored inside of the object or reference to these objects must be stored in this object, which are passed by to the constructor as the player is creating the orders here, right? Then eventually it's gonna be put in the list and then eventually the execute all orders is gonna ask the player to get the order and then it's gonna call execute on it, which is then going to call execute here, which is then gonna validate the order. <clears throat> I didn't put the conditions here because it was too long. Anyway, so it checks if the order is valid. If it is, then it actually is, uh, again, this is uh, quite long code here. That's why I didn't have it. If you want to see the code, just look in the, in the files that you will find on the website. So if it's valid, then it actually implements the logic of uh, what is advanced. So depending on if the target belongs to the player that initiated the order, then the armies are just moved there. If uh, the target um, uh, territory belongs to an enemy, then there's a battle. Here I have implemented a very simplistic battle, okay? not like what you do in the project. So that's about it for these two design patterns. So eventually what I'm gonna ask you is to uh, refactor your code so that you include both the state pattern as well as the command pattern in your project. These are going to be uh, have to be documented using uh, refactoring operations. I'm going to show that in the, the next video when I talk about refactoring. At the end of the video, I'm going to explain how I want you to document your refactoring operations. That's going to include the introduction of the command pattern and the introduction of the state pattern. So that's it for me for this video. Thank you.